Good morning. Good morning, North Freedom Baptist. I think some of us need some more coffee this morning. Good morning. Good morning. All right, that's better. We are an all-participating type of church. At least that's where I hope to lead us. And uh, thank you for coming. It's good to see you. Trust that you are uh, doing well and reminded today that you are blessed. God loves you. He is for you. And he's gathered us together today to give him honor, glory, and praise. So thank you for coming today. Uh, a couple of things, highlights this morning. Uh, as you will notice throughout the service today, we are kind of going back to everything being pre-COVID. And so we are no longer relaxing into our COVID restrictions, whatever we did. But uh, we are going to be passing the plate. We are going to have uh, hand passed out bulletins and such. And so uh, a lot of things going back to the way it used to be for uh, you know, many years ago. Uh, with that, if you did not get a bulletin this morning, please raise your hand and one of our ushers will get you a bulletin if you need one. In that bulletin, there are two inserts. One insert would be the uh, message notes for you to use if you would choose to do so. And also this pink thing. And I made it pink. It's going to be a different color each month because I want to make sure you notice it. Um, but it is a all-month church calendar. Everything happening in the church, for the church, through the church, is going to be on this calendar. And so if you are involved in the ministry and you need something on the church calendar, please let myself or Christy know um, at least two weeks before the end of the month so that we have time to get everything scheduled together and put out for you and printed and everything. So uh, keep that in mind. With that, there is a few announcements just to remind us all of. I'm not going to remind everybody of everything this morning. I'm going to trust that you can read and that uh, you will look at these calendars. But uh, tonight we will meet at 6.30 uh, for prayer. Tuesday at 6.30 for uh, Active Faith Bible Study. And also third Friday night we are going to have a game night this week. And we tried it back in January, but so many people were sick. We thought we'd just wait. So we're going to try it this week. And uh, hope that... Yes, this month. So this month it will happen on the 18th. And so be looking forward to that. And the Chaos to Clarity Conference for youth, for anybody really, but especially for our youth, uh, anybody uh, college age and under, uh, teenage at least, um, looking forward to that opportunity. If you have questions about that, more info will be given starting next week. Um, I believe that's it for the announcements today, so we're going to go ahead. We have a full schedule for us today, so we're going to go ahead and move into a time of worship. Let me begin with an opening prayer. Father, this morning we thank you for bringing us together to be reminded once again of who you are and what you've done for us. Your love demonstrated to us through the cross where your son died for our sins, that we might have forgiveness, that we might have eternal life, that we might know you and live for you and with you forever. Father, we thank you for your blessings, your provision. We pray that you would remind us once again of your great love, your mercy, and your grace. Remind us that you are the God who saves once again today, that we might lift up our voices and declare your praises because you are God, and we are thankful for all that you have done for us. Guide and direct all that is said and done today, we pray. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Stand with me if you would, please. Let us recite together the Lord's Prayer as we begin our time of worship. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us lift our voices.
Media Networks again this morning. Thankful for all the blessings that God has provided us through his people here at North Free Baptist. Thank you for this opportunity to pause and reflect upon God's goodness to us as well. That God is a God who gives and has called his people to give as much as he has given uh, with generous hearts willing to give to the Lord, knowing that he will provide for all of our needs as he supplies for his ministry to be done, his work to be done in and through his church and through his servants. So at this time, we'll ask our ushers to come forward if they would, please, and we'll take this morning's offer. Thank you, John. Let's pray. Father, this morning we want to just pause for a moment and just thank you for your provision. Thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the opportunity to be a part of what you are doing in and through this church, in and around the world through ADB missions, and the future of this church as well, Father, that you are funding and providing for your work to be done, that your name would be magnified, that more people would know the name and love of Christ. We pray that we would all know that we are a part of this ministry together, and that we support it together as you have called us to give each one of us generously according to your property. We pray that your will would be done with these gifts, and that you would continue to bless each giver. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. <laughs>
portion of the account from the Gospel of Luke of the Last Supper, Jesus' final meal with his disciples before he goes to the cross. And it's rather interesting, Luke is unique in the fact that he talks about two cups. The first cup is uh, part of the Jewish Passover ceremony ritual that they would do on that Passover meal, uh, in that Passover meal, and it just reflected what God had done for his people there, of course, once again. But Jesus uses it to say that this is the final time in which I will participate in this meal with you. This is the last time I will drink of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. It was Jesus' final meal. He's signifying something to his disciples and to us that a new era is coming. And he will once again join with all of his people, all of the church, together in a day yet future even for us, in which we will all partake of the cup together with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he goes on to describe how uh, symbolically what his death means, that his life is like bread, broken, that we might have life. He is human, he came God in the form of a man, he is fully human and fully God, and he gave his life that we might have life, spiritual life. And the bread, of course, represents his broken body, taking our punishment upon the cross. And then, of course, the final cup after supper, the cup of redemption, which signifies the blood that was on the doorpost and the blood that would flow from Jesus' head and his hands and his feet and his pierced side. The blood that would cut, signify, solemnize the new covenant in his blood. A new covenant in which the old covenant is done away with and now we have this new life that we can live in Christ with God as his law is written on our hearts through his spirit that we might be fully obedient to him. And so as we come to the table together we are reminded that this is a unique and wonderful thing meant for the church, for believers. It is a reminder for us of what Christ has done for us. It is a proclamation of what Christ has done for all sinners through his death and his resurrection, that we might be forgiven, find salvation, and eternal life. It is also a time of unity for the church. We are the body of Christ on earth as we are his people. And he ministers to us, to each other, and to the world through us. And so these symbols, bread and juice, reflect the body and the blood that was broken and shed for us. It's also a time for us to recognize, once again, and remember that we are sinners, and yet even in Christ we do still fall into sin from time to time. And we do need to approach this table with a pure heart and a pure mind, a pure conscience. So we take a few moments to say, Lord, if there be any wicked way in me, cleanse me, purify me, change my heart that I might be fully yours. If there's a, uh, an issue between you and another believer this morning, uh, I advise you to not participate until that is resolved. If there's an issue between you and the Lord that you are struggling with, and you're not quite at that time that you're in a good relationship with the Lord, I would advise you to not participate this morning until those issues are resolved and you are once again walking properly with the Lord and with his people. For this is a time for us to be together, purified church, remembering what the Lord has done for us. So before we take a few moments of uh, remembrance and of silent personal prayer, let us celebrate what the Lord has done for us by singing a hymn today. Hymn number 189, Calvary Covers It All, verses 1 and 2. This is what we are here to remember and proclaim, that Christ's death on Calvary covers our sin and shame. Stand with me if you would, please. Hymn 189 in the hymn well, if you need it today.
today is uh, we all take a moment to reflect upon our life, to talk with the Lord, to ask Him to examine our hearts, that we might be pure and come together, unified together at this table. Take a few moments and go to the Lord. Father, this morning, once again, we say thank you with grateful hearts. We cannot say thank you enough. We cannot praise you enough for what you have done for us in Christ. We thank you for this time of remembrance. We thank you for the opportunity to give you praise for salvation provided through your Son, Jesus. We pray that you would daily remind us of the cost of our salvation, the death of your Son, and also the life that we have in him through his resurrection. May we strive to live a pure life before you each day. May we strive to walk in holiness and truth, guided by your spirit through your word. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Mike and I pass the bread this morning, it's again an opportunity to Reflect upon what Christ has done for us, our relationship with him, and to also praise him for what he has done through the reading of scripture, if you so choose. Jesus, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for all that you have blessed us with. And most importantly, Lord, we thank you for coming to earth to save us from our sins. You sacrificed your body and, and took all of our sin upon you. And uh, we thank you for that. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. The bread symbolizes the body of Christ. And as he said with his disciples, he said to them, This is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance. share the cup of juice representing the blood of Christ. Again, the opportunity to reflect, to thank the Lord for his salvation, his shed blood, and to give praise through scripture today if you desire.
pray and thank the Lord for shedding his blood for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for allowing, for coming, for letting yourself be beaten, broken, bruised, wearing the crown of thorns, allowing the nails to pierce your hands and your feet, hanging there on that cross, your uh, spear piercing your side, that your blood would flow. For as your word says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. We thank you for letting your blood flow for us, that we might be eternally forgiven and have a relationship with the Father through you. We take this, remembering what you have done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, Jesus said after the supper, take the cup and drink this in remembrance. Let's praise our Savior one more time this morning for dying for our sins. Hymn number 81, what a wonderful Savior. It's Jesus by Jesus. Hymn number 81, first verse.
As we turn to Romans chapter 6, we'll read the passage in just a moment, but uh, we're going to continue on. We get kind of take a, a brief rabbit trail reminder today in our series, Taking Every Thought Captive. A few weeks ago, we began a message from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 about examining the ideologies, the worldviews, the false teachings that are out there in our world today, and uh, examine them by the scriptures, not to put them down, not to make fun of or make light of, but to take them and share with us what the Bible says about these ideas and ideologies, whether they hold up compared to biblical truth or not. So we have looked at a variety of those already, and we're going to continue to do so um, beginning next week. But as we do this, I want us to remember that it is very easy to not always have the best heart or intention when doing so. Because each of us, on our personal daily basis, is going to have to take these ideologies, these isms, and reflect upon them. And sometimes we have to work with people, live with people who believe these things. To be absolutely true, to not believe them, is to be like, you are like of the devil or something. And they might not say that, but that's kind of the idea that comes across. And we can sometimes come across as if, well, if you practice this, then, then you are you know, evil and wicked, and you must be stopped. And, we can overcome in the flesh more often than in the spirit, or come against in the flesh more often than in the spirit. We want to do this in a way that brings honor and glory to Christ. And I think one of the ways that helps me to remember this is to remember what the ultimate goal is. For the church, the ultimate goal is not to conquer every ism and worldview that's out there. The ultimate goal for the church is to make disciples all nations. Every opportunity we have to debate, to argue, not like me and argue, but to, to debate, to have that question and answer, asking each other, sharpening each other's worldviews and things like that, every opportunity we have to do that is an opportunity to share truth, to lead people to the gospel. We want people to be transformed, to have the new life, the true and proper perspective that only God can give them. We could have every argument and everything, the most persuasive, be the most persuasive person, and have all the right facts and truths, everything lined up exactly, and people will still reject it because their hearts are not transformed. That happens as we pray and as we approach them with truth in a Christ-like manner. Not everybody believed everything that Jesus said. In fact, most people rejected Jesus, even though he was truth embodied, walking among them, and demonstrated the power of truth, God's truth, in front of their very eyes. So we can expect to have some failures, I guess you could say, but they're not really failures, because any opportunity to share the gospel is a success. So this morning I want to remind us about what happens to us when we trust Christ. We are united to Christ. We are a new life, a new person. We are born again. And that's what we want for those who do not yet believe. Even if they are very antagonistic towards the gospel, towards Christianity, towards the church, towards Christians, towards you. So this morning, before I pray, let us read Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5, to set the stage for us. And just elaborate a few, for a few minutes on each of these verses today. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. Let's pray. Father, this morning I pray that you would guide and direct us into your word, that we would understand your truth, that we would be willing and ready to live it out, to apply it to our lives, and to see you work as we strive to be obedient, led and empowered by your spirit. Father, help me this morning to communicate your truth today, not my truth, but the truth that you have given to us through your Son, through your Spirit, to us written down in these words. 
Father, apply your word to our hearts and minds today. Help us to be the people you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. As we continue to remember what Christ has done for us on the cross, I want us to, to look at and highlight this truth that believers are united to Christ in such a way that we are freed from sin. We are dead to sin, and we are able to live righteously before God. And that is what we want, not only for ourselves and for our family, for our friends, but that's what we want and should be what we want for the whole world. We want the world to come to this realization that they are slaves to sin, that they are deceived, they are unable to do anything but sin and incur the wrath of God upon themselves. And apart from Christ, they have no salvation. We want them to know and understand that so that they will come to Christ, seek his forgiveness, and have a transformed heart and mind. We want to remember this for ourselves and for others. Remember this for ourselves, that we'll continue to live in victory, but so that we remember the ultimate outcome for why we stand up for truth in a world of darkness. We could be out there advocating for every good cause under the sun, and many of which we should, especially as believers within reason. We can strive to get our politicians to pass certain laws and so on. We can vote, and we should vote as best we can, but with the transformation of sinners' hearts, as the point of all of what we do. Because without the transformation of a sinner's heart, it doesn't matter what laws are passed. People are only going to do what they want to do as far as sin will allow them to do it. We think this morning, and we think this year especially, of the opportunity, the possibility that the famous Supreme Court case, Roe versus Wade, will be overturned could be overturned. It's very likely. There's never been a greater chance for this very raw decision to be changed, to be reversed, so that at least the states have the power, constitutionally speaking, to decide these laws and whether or not they should have them or not. But even if Roe v. Wade should be overturned, it will not end abortion in America, and it will not end the debate. In fact, it may even make it worse. It will change things. It will reset the clock back to 1973. And that is a very good thing. But if we want to end abortion, if we want to end any of the other evils in our nation, even in the church, we need to preach the gospel. We need to be witnesses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because only when hearts are transformed and they see the hope that is found alone in Jesus Christ will abortion be almost non-existent and every other evil that is in our world that will only be conquered and will only end as more people trust in the Christ and live for him. See, the problem is not just the sins that are committed or the unbiblical worldviews that are implemented into policies around the world. The real problem is the sinner's heart. As Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, uh, verses 21 through 23, it's what comes out of our hearts. It's our heart that is defiled. It is the seed within us that only produces bad fruit, fruit that will lead to judgment. The heart must be changed. And that's why we want to emphasize the new covenant when we talk about, uh, and when we come to the table of communion together, the Lord's Supper. There's a new covenant. He is going to give us a new heart when we submit and surrender to Him. So this morning, I want to remind us of the great truth that believers are united to Christ because we have surrendered to Christ. We have believed in his name. We have believed in his work and who he is. And as such, we are transformed to live a life of righteousness. This is what we want for those who do not yet know Christ. So the main idea for us today, believers have been united to Christ and are freed from sin that we might live a new life of righteousness. And that's what we want for our loved ones, and for complete strangers even, that God may bring us to, to witness. So we look at these few verses. Romans chapter 6 is one of my favorite passages in all the scripture. Um, and so we're just going to walk through this real briefly. We did this several years ago during a, a baptism service. And I'm not going to focus so much on water baptism, although it does help us to understand some of these things. But Romans chapter one, verse through 6, verse 1. The Apostle writes, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? The Apostle Paul is being accused. He has been accused by many in Rome, in the Church of Rome, and in other churches, that you're too lenient on sin. 
Everybody can just ask for forgiveness, and it's all right. You can move forward. And Paul's like, no, that, that, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. In the first one, the, the Apostle Paul is continuing to teach us about the power of the gospel and the transformation that the gospel brings to those who trust in Christ as their Lord and Savior. He began the book by talking about the total depravity of sin, meaning that we have no other choice but to sin apart from Christ, and that we can never do anything righteous in God's eyes as sinners. Our hearts are sin, and we only desire sin. All have sinned. Everybody, Jew, Gentile, doesn't matter who you are, how old you are, how young you are, when you were born, whatever, if you are a human being, you're a sinner. And that any sinner can be justified by God through their faith in Jesus, his death and resurrection on their behalf. So this caused some to think that if God does all of this, if God is so kind to us to forgive us by his grace, then we can just go on living because we want to, and God is just going to forgive, and we can just be what we'd like to be. Some people today practice this as if it is true in the church. This is why chapter 6 begins this way. Paul is anticipating an accusation that he's already heard before, but as people in Rome might like, read this book, they might be thinking, well, wait a minute, Paul, what about, and he's like, what shall we say then? Shall we say, shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? The phrase go on, or continue in, or keep in, or keep on sinning, depending on your translation, refers to the idea of purposeful, habitual persistence. He is referring to intentional, willful sinning as an established pattern of living. And I'm going to borrow some language from some famous pastors here today to make this go a little bit quicker. But he's referring to those that sin that we live in before Christ. We gladly choose to do it. We relish it. We, we, we long for it. It's like, Christians, we don't do that. We must remember that before someone comes to faith in Christ, the only way of life is one of sin that incurs God's wrath. Some people thought that Paul was teaching that a believer could live that kind of a life in Christ. And Paul, in verse 2, responds to that at the beginning of verse 2. He's like, by no means. Absolutely not. Paul responds with the most emphatic and strongest terms possible that he could ever use. So it's translated in many uh, versions of our Bible as by no means, or heaven forbid, or may it never be, absolutely not. He's shocked that anybody could ever think of such a thing about the gospel and grace of Christ. He's vehemently standing against that false teaching that somebody could just live however they want to live, and God is just going to be happy with them, just because they made a statement of faith. This is the strongest words of repudiation in the entire New Testament Greek. He continues by stating that we, meaning believers, we Christians, we have died to sin. He says in verse 2, we died to sin. How can we live any, in it any longer? Someone who has died is now free from sin. It's just like you'll go on to say in, in chapter 7, when somebody is married and one of the spouses dies, then another, that spouse who's still living is free to marry again and not commit adultery. They're not sinning. Because their commitment to their spouse, their first spouse, is now complete. Till death do we part. But if they continue to live and God brings somebody else into their life, they are free to marry. And so the, the idea is kind of like that with us. We are now free to live in Christ. He is our spouse, in a sense. We are dead to sin, and so now we can live and enjoy a life with Christ. Christians, upon our confession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, are said to have died with Jesus. If that is true, then how could, or even why, would a believer want to, let alone purposely choose to live in sin? which sent Jesus to the cross. If we've been united with Christ through our profession of faith, and that is a sincere belief like we've talked about in the book of John and even before then, then we're united to Christ. Christ can't sin. Christ doesn't want to sin. We're given a new seed within us, a godly seed that bears righteous fruit, not wicked fruit, or not some fruit that's wicked and some fruit that's righteous. It's not a mixture. Like if you take a bite, you get a little bit of both. You know, it's like the ice cream cones used to be kind of a, famous, you know, you get chocolate and vanilla all at once, you know. The Christian life is not like that. 
When we are transformed, we are transformed. We are God's children. We belong to Him. We are totally righteous. Not just declared to be, but that is how we are. And we are growing to be what we have been declared to be. In verses 3 through 10, especially, and truly throughout the rest of the chapter, Paul gives his reasoning for such a bold statement. We're going to look at some of those reasons this morning in verses 2 through 5. The apostles' reasoning for why he can say, may it never be that we would go on sinning that grace may increase. We've died to sin because we're united in Christ. All of us who were baptized, verse 3, into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. Don't you remember that? Don't you understand that, he's saying? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. So if we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection, or you could say in his life. Simply put, Paul's reasoning is that we're dead to sin. Before we were sinners, we were dead in sin and dead to God. We were dead to Christ. Now that we are believers, it's switched. We are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When we place our faith and trust in Jesus, his death and resurrection on our behalf, and, and trust in death, but his death and resurrection is our death and resurrection. Spiritually speaking, we're spiritually united we're baptized by the Holy Spirit into Jesus. Essentially, we become spiritually one with Jesus. It's like a, a marriage. It's not really a marriage, but it's two separate things coming together that could not have come together before. But because of the cross, we can. And now we have this unique relationship that is very similar to a marriage. It's very intimate in a very spiritual way. And it is very unique. Essentially, we become spiritually one with Jesus so that it's as if we died on the cross with Jesus. I hope that you're thinking amen in your hearts because it means that your sin is gone if you are truly in Christ. There is no condemnation, Paul's going to say later on, based partly because of this. We're in Christ. We're dead to sin. This is what water baptism symbolizes. This is the, the showing off of this great truth. Paul isn't really teaching about water baptism here, but it helps us to understand what happens spiritually the moment we trust in Christ. When we are immersed into the water, that is a symbol of death, a symbol of being buried with Christ, having died with Christ upon the cross. So we're dead spiritually now to sin. Sin no longer held against us, and now we have a new heart and a new life. And when we raise up out of the water, we have been resurrected with Christ to live a new and transformed life. Now that doesn't always happen automatically as far as how we practice our life. We still have the flesh, the body, that is warring against this new thing that God is doing within us. We have to fight against that. And the fight is evidence of true salvation faith. So we are said, Paul says here, to have died with Christ and then to be alive in Christ. This is so that just as Jesus was raised by the glory or by the power of the Father for his glory, we too may live in and through Christ, living a new life. And we await our personal resurrection. When we, either by rapture or by resurrection, shall be united with Christ forever. So Paul is stating emphatically here that it is impossible for someone to truly abuse grace. Because a true believer will know and understand that they are dead to sin. Themselves to be dead to it in Christ. Sin is dead to us. It is unfathomable. It is contradictory for anyone to think that a believer could ever live in sin and be a true believer. But you might be thinking, well, what about, Pastor Andy? I just did this yesterday. A person's life will either be dominated by sin or dominated, controlled by the Spirit, by Christ. Christians obviously are able to commit sins. I still sin. Ask my family. I still lose my patience. I still act in ways that I should not act. I'm not like a vile, vile, wicked individual beating up my family or anything like that. No. But I'm still, I'm a recovering sinner, right? You know, we all are to a degree. I'm still battling sin in my life, trying to allow the Spirit to live and produce fruit in me. But we are not able to live perpetually in those sins as we did before. 
1 John 3, 9, no one who is born of God practices sin. That, just like we said earlier, that keeps on sinning, continues in sin. We don't practice sin on a regular basis. But if that is a if that is the reality of your life, that you are just so like, I am going to do this sin. I, can, I don't care what the Bible says. You know, I can, I can do this and God's just going to be happy with me because, you know, he loves me. That is a bad sign that you have not truly surrendered your heart and life to Christ. Because God's seed abides in those who have trusted in Christ. And we cannot sin because he is born of God. It is not merely that Christians should not continue to live in the realm and dimension of sin, but that we cannot. Yes, we might fall into temptation every once in a while. But if we are quick to confess it, to repent of it, to admit it, to confess it to others, confess it to the Lord, and move on from that and strive to not fall back into that sin again, then that is a good sign that we are living righteously with God and for God. But if we have no guilty conscience at all, what did you just do? Did you really just do that? Did you just look at that person and say that in your head? The Spirit is not challenging us through our conscience, through the Word, when we read it. But we're not following that, then there might be a problem that we need to address. Not only is salvation a transaction, and this is a direct quote of the pastor, he says, not only is salvation a transaction, my sin to Christ, sin's righteousness to me, but it's also a transformation. It's not just about legal details, spiritually speaking, it's an actual transformation. Christ died not only for what we did, also died for who we are. For who we were so that we could become something different. You must be born again, he said to Nicodemus. And that is exactly what we're talking about. Paul tells believers, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Colossians 3.3. 3. Even more explicitly, he declares that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old is gone and the new things have come. We who belong to Christ were transformed. Yes, we might still struggle with sin. The struggle is a good sign. I know I'm sinning in this area. I, forgive me, Father. Help me to move forward and to not fall into this sin again. The purpose of our salvation is transformation. It's the purpose of Jesus going to the cross to transform sinners from lovers of sin to lovers of God into all that he is. That is what we want to never forget for ourselves. We are united to Christ. He is our Savior. We are in Him. God sees us in Christ. It is also what should motivate us to share the gospel because transformation is the only thing that's going to move someone from hell to heaven for eternity. The gospel transformation as we believe in Christ. Anyone who trusts in Christ as Lord and Savior is transformed, forgiven, receiving. That's what we want as we continue to talk about what the Bible says about racism and what the Bible says about our identity, about all sorts of different things that are going on in our world, all sorts of different philosophies and false teachings that are coming out and even becoming a part of the church. We want to stand against them by the word of God. And we want to say to people who believe in them, no, that is not the truth. That is going to kill you. That is going to lead you into more and more suffering and harm. Only the truth of the gospel will lead you to true life. We want to do so in a way so that they will understand and know the truth of the gospel and be transformed to be like Christ. The rest of Romans 6 kind of illustrates this. Uh, verse 16, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you, were, when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. Whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God, though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching, the gospel, to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and become slaves to righteousness. Be Christ's slave to righteousness. And endeavor to promote others to be slaves to righteousness as well. As we share the gospel, even when we stand against false teaching. So as believers united to Christ, let us remember we've died to sin. We are alive in Christ. Yes, there's a struggle there. Keep on struggling. Keep on fighting. 
God will see us through. Christ will see us through. You do not have to sin. You do not have to give in to temptation. You can say no in the power of the Spirit based upon the power of the Word of God. No, if you know that you are in a particular sin, that you're susceptible to a particular temptation, find verses in God's Word which will help you to stand firm against it. The Word is our offensive weapon against sin and temptation. Jesus used it. We are to use it. Something is a particular sin to you. Find a verse or two or three, memorize it, know it, so that you can stand on a moment's notice and pray it, that the Lord would help you to be pure and not fall into sin, because you don't have to. You have the power of Christ to help you to live righteously. I'm not going to say it won't be a struggle. Sometimes it might be a struggle. Sometimes it might make you sweat. And it might make you really, really, I mean, it might be a physical struggle to not sin. But we do not have to give in. God will supply. And he has supplied his church as well to help us to overcome sin. And we need to be a people of God who can know each other well enough and be sharing with each other that we are weak in certain areas. It doesn't have to be the entire church, but another brother and another sister that we can go to and say, I'm struggling in this area today. Will you pray for me? Will you come and sit with me and help me until this temptation has passed? so that I would be pure. We are to help each other. That's one of the reasons for this body of Christ, to help us to overcome sin in our lives. May we be such a church. And may we be a church that spreads the message of salvation, that we can be changed to live the life that God wants us to live, to be the people he wants us to be, to live a life of freedom as we are slaves to righteousness. Father, we thank you for this remembrance. We thank you for these words, these truths. Sometimes they are hard for us to understand. Father, we pray that you would help us to trust in faith that your word is true. And even as I so inadequately shared this truth, Father, I pray that your spirit would properly help us to understand and walk and live in the truth. Help us to share and have a desire to share the gospel that people would be transformed. And may we change the world through the proclamation of the gospel, as you have called us to. In your good time, through the Spirit, we pray. Help us to be praying for family, friends, co-workers, even complete strangers that you bring across our path, that they would be receptive to the Spirit's working on their hearts to receive the gospel, that you might produce righteousness, forgiveness in them, giving them eternal life. Help us to fight against sin in our own life empowered by the truth that we are united to Christ and we can say no to sin. We do not have to give in to temptation. Give us the courage and the strength to be the kind of people that fellow believers can come to and say, I need help. May we not judge them, but look at them as someone who needs help, ready to be there for us when we need help as well. Father, help us to be such a people, to love each other in such a way that the world would see something different in us and long to know the Savior who changes hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymnal with me if you would one final time this morning. Let's turn to 201. Let's sing of that grace which God has provided. The grace that is greater than our sin. The grace that enables us to live a life of righteousness.
This morning as we are dismissed, let us commit our hearts and our lives once again to following Christ and to proclaiming the gospel. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Father, dismiss us now with your grace, with your peace, empowered, emboldened, and encouraged to share the gospel, to live the life that has been purchased for us by Christ, a life that is in him, empowered by his spirit. Give us your heart for the lost, we pray. Thank you for coming.